This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Today, I'm going to be going solo to summarize the current state of the debate that I've been having with George Selgin and to a lesser extent with Larry White on the age-old question of fractional reserve banking and how should Austrians feel about it. But before we dive into that fun stuff, let me mention the Mises Supporters Summit in October. And there's going to be a bunch of us there. Uh, It's going to be me, but also uh, Lou Rockwell, Tom Woods, Peter Klein, Tom DiLorenzo, and many others. So it's going to be held at Hilton Head, South Carolina, specifically October 10th through the 12th. If you're interested, registration is now available for Mises members going to mises.org slash SS24. So again, the Supporters Summit this October 10th through 12th at Hilton Head. Go to mises.org slash SS24 for all the details. Hope we can see you there. Okay, so for today's episode, as I say, I've been having this ongoing feud. It's also a scientific investigation. We're all interested just in the truth here. But it has to do with with George Selgin, and we've been going back and forth on my personal podcast. He's been tweeting up a storm every time I present something new, and I was originally responding to a fairly recent interview that I saw him give. So. At this point, I thought there's a lot of material here, and I'm going to try to summarize in this episode of the Human Action Podcast and bring all of you good folks up to speed. And the big picture is this. So I don't, I don't want to be uh, misunderstood. Throughout today's episode, I'm going to be giving a lot of evidence as to why the historical case of Scotland is not, by any stretch, a textbook illustration of, quote, free banking in action. And and for, for that definition, or you know, what do I mean by free banking in action? I mean even using the theory of free banking as it's presented by uh, people like George Selgin and Larry White. All right, so if, if you don't know the background, Murray Rothbard and then a lot of his uh, followers are 100% reservists. So everybody in this genre who is you know, a, a big fan of Austrian economics and then in many cases are either outright anarcho-capitalist or at least very limited government minarchists, um, are all free bankers in the sense that they don't want a bunch of excessive regulation from the government. They don't like central banks. Often they, they certainly don't like state-issued fiat currency. So that's true of not just Murray Rothbard and Joe Salerno and Hans Hoppe and Guido Hulsman and, and me, but it's also true of Selgin and White. Uh, Steve Horowitz was another person uh, who was big in the free banker fractional reserve camp. Okay, so that's true of, of all of us, that we don't like excessive government intervention in this stuff. But where the method of disagreement comes in, and then the people calling themselves free bankers who embrace that term, tend to believe that, oh, if... If we had a a laissez-faire approach to banking, reserve ratios might be low. And there's nothing wrong with fractional reserve banking per se. Uh, Just let the market decide, right? Just, you know, we we don't determine how many uh, weeks worth of soda are on the shelves of the grocery store, right? We just leave entrepreneurs, let let them deal with that. If somebody's running a parking garage... We, uh, you know, leave it up to them to know whether they're going to sell out or not. Okay. Uh, if an airline overbooks flights, we leave that to the market to decide. And they can come up with a system for how do they deal with that if a flight's overbooked and what do they got. And so likewise, people in this camp say, let bankers decide how much of the actual money to keep in the vault backing up checking accounts. And if there's a bank run and people show up and they want their money and the bank gets caught with its pants down, okay, it'll go out of business and lesson learned, but don't from top down regulation or not even within like the legal system itself mandate at the outset that, oh yeah, checking account balances have to be backed up hundred percent by uh, reserves you know, in the vault or something, right? So that's what the fractional reserve free banking camp says. 
And then again, in this literature, often the term free banker refers to those people, whereas Rothbard and his disciples on this point are 100% reservist. But again, they would also be in favor of free banking in the sense that, yeah, they're anarcho-capitalists, most of them. Also, just another point to avoid confusion, both sides at various points in this debate like to claim Mises as being one of them. And it's it can be confusing at first glance because in plenty of places in his writings, Mises is in favor of free banking. And even in context, it's clear he means the government doesn't do anything special with banks except, you know, have them enforce their contracts and, you know, you can't slave your workers, you know, standard stuff that they would just as well apply to a pizza shop or, you know, to a uh, a lawn cutting business. Like there's nothing special about government regulation of contracts and so forth when it comes to banking. And so that was Mises' position. And so the people in the fractured reserve free banking camp cite him a lot and say, see, Mises is with us. But when you read more into it, in the fuller context, you see that Mises thought any extension of bank credit that was not backed up by genuine savings. So in context, what he would call the issuance of new fiduciary media. So fiduciary media, meaning claims to money that the banks issue that are not backed up by money in the vault would set off the trade cycle, right? So in our terminology, the Austrian boom bust cycle or the Austrian business cycle. Okay. And so Mises was a free banker because he thought that was the best mechanism to constrain fractional reserve banking. That he thought in practice, you know, at various points in his career, he was okay with actually insisting on 100% reserves or at least 100% reserves for newly issued uh, claims to money. But at other points, you know, when he's in favor of free banking, it's clear that is he's saying because practically speaking, just leave it to the market. That's the best way to police the banks, and that if you, for example, relied on a, a top-down government regulation insisting on 100% reserves, that could backfire on you because then when a crisis comes around, the government might relax that, right? And so he's saying it'd be better if you had this system that was sort of autonomous, and it had its own internal checks that prevented banks from having uh, low reserve ratios and just let the market discipline keep the reserve ratios up there. And that was actually, in practice, the best way to keep high reserve ratios, right? So um, that's what I would... That's Joe Salerno's position, and I think it's crystal clear that that's what Mises is saying. Okay. So one more bit of housekeeping before I dive into the particulars of this episode. I am not here trying to throw out everything that, for example, Larry White has done on the Scottish episode of so-called free banking. And and I'm partly saying it because I don't want people to be defensive. Right? And some of this stuff, you can understand why, you know, and I'm going to read to you later in this episode, Murray Rothbard's scathing critique of White's work on this topic. And so you can understand why White himself and then his you know, colleagues and fans would bristle at that. And, whoa! and, and what I want to say is we can learn from the Scottish free banking episode, and it does still teach some valuable lessons about what would unregulated banking look like. But when it comes to the question of what would the reserve ratio be among banks in a genuinely free market, I don't think the Scottish episode is a good one for us to draw lessons from that or, or on that particular point. Okay, so that's that's my, my point is here. I am not saying, or let me put it to you this way. The conventional problem that most economists have with free banking is not that the reserve ratio would be too low and would set off the Austrian boom-bust cycle, right? Paul Krugman doesn't believe in the Austrian boom-bust cycle. He admits it's a theoretical possibility, but he doesn't think in practice the stuff Mises talks about is what's going on with most market economies, right? Krugman is a Keynesian. 
he thinks it's because, oh, there's inadequate ag- aggregate demand, and that, that's why there's a role for the central bank and or the fiscal authorities to come in and tinker in order to prop up aggregate demand to restore full employment. Okay, So Paul Krugman is, of course, against free banking. Right? If you ask Paul Krugman, hey, should banks have any special regulations besides those applied to pizza joints or lawn cutting businesses, Krugman would say, oh, yeah. We, we've seen laissez-faire in banking in like the 1920s, and look what happened. So no, we absolutely do not want to have laissez-faire banking. Okay, But again, the, the reason would not be because he's a Misesian when it comes to the business cycle. And, um, and so, so my point being, conventional economists and the reasons they might think banks need to be highly regulated and entry into the field needs to be much stricter than to say, oh yeah, let some kid open up a, a, a lemonade stand. And, oh yeah, let that guy down there, if he wants to open a bank, go ahead and take deposits. That most economists probably think that, oh, banking is such a sensitive, important industry that that's got to be highly regulated. And so the, the their fears as to what would happen if you allowed basically open entry into the banking sector and particularly if you allowed banks to issue their own notes, right? So that's that's another element that for the modern person, it's difficult to even understand some of this earlier literature on the you know, so-called free banking periods, because back when gold and silver coins were the actual money, there was a period, for example, like in the, in the U.S., where individual commercial banks would issue their own notes, and the note was uh, something that said, if you present this at a bank, you can get the actual money, which are namely, you know, gold and silver coins, is stamped in certain denominations of U.S. dollars, but they were actually gold and silver coins. Okay, whereas for us now, the bank doesn't issue a note per se, right? That's not what we see. The, the notes we're used to are Federal Reserve notes, right? The Federal Reserve is itself a bank, so that's where that stuff all comes from historically. But now. Obviously, the Federal Reserve note is not a ticket entitling you to go get gold or silver. It's just it's its own thing. But that's kind of the ghost of what the past used to be. Okay, so most economists, when they recoil at the idea of just having banks being able to set up shop, open up your new bank, take deposits, and then issue notes, they have all these fears about what would happen in, a, in an unregulated wildcat. That's another term, like wildcat banks system like that. And so I do think that, you know, uh, Larry White's, for example, and other people who have studied those periods, there's also other examples. Like in Canada, there was a large period where banking was relatively unregulated. Um, that, yeah, you can study that, those periods to see, did competition work in this sector? And is it true that, oh yeah, if you just allowed open entry and freedom in the banking sector, fly-by-night companies would come in and they would get all the legitimate money and they'd issue all these bogus notes. And then two weeks later, they would leave town and everybody would be left holding these worthless notes. Right? Those are the kind of stories you hear. And so I think, yeah, we can learn a lot about how would competition in the banking sector work by studying these periods where it was relatively light regulation. Having said all that, though, what I'm going to now focus on going forward in this particular episode is the more specific question of in an unregulated banking sector where either there's you know private law enforcement like in a Rothbardian ANCAP society, or if there is a conventional state, it's very, you know, night watchman-y, and all it does is enforce contracts and keep out foreign invaders and that kind of stuff, and it only has enough taxes to fund those bare to, those uh, basic functions. It's, it's not engaging in redistribution and setting up a big social safety net and that kind of stuff. If you had that kind of a model, and then to say, what would the reserve ratio of banks be in that world? Then I'm saying studying the case of Scotland doesn't help us much at all, as I will show you as we go forward now. So that's the specific argument I'm making here, and that's what I want to bring you folks up to speed to understand Here's what one side says, and then here's what the response of the free bankers is, and then here's what the 100 percenters say, and, da, 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 and just to kind of um, bring you up to where things are. All right, so to that end, let me play for you two quotes here just to show you that I'm not attacking a straw man. So this first quote or excerpt uh, 
comes from it was the Q and A portion. I was debating George Selgin at the Soho Forum. Uh, the moderator for this one was Gene Epstein. And so this is from the Q and A of that uh, session or that that debate, and you'll see that George places a lot of well, he he was prompted by a question from Gene, but you'll see here how one would have thought based on what Selgin says here that. Yep, we had genuine free banking in Scotland, and the reserve ratios were quite low. And so, and and what else? What other evidence do you need? We don't need to sit around and speculate as to what would the reserve ratios be like in a free market. Look at what happened in Scotland, guys. How can any? How can these Rothbardians possibly be continuing to argue that um, you know we see such low reserve ratios, and that must be because of government distortion? Sorry, before I play this clip, one last caveat I'm I'm realizing, in case you're confused. You might think, wait a minute, I'm looking around. There's there's not 100% reserve banks right now. So what do you you mean? Well, in a highly regulated environment, the people, the 100% reservists, like, you know, Rothbard, Guido Holzman, people like that, and now me, as I've joined their ranks, um, we would say, oh, because, for example, in the United States, there's FDIC, right? So right now, if you have a checking account up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, is guaranteed by the government that even if there's a bank run, even if the bank goes down, you're good, right? And so that relaxes the constraint that the customers aren't worried about their bank being able to redeem their checking account deposits, and so that sort of market discipline fades away. But then, perhaps more serious, there's a central bank that. Its ostensible purpose was to be a lender of last resort, right? When the Fed was founded, that was one of the main reasons for it, ostensibly. Okay. And so once you get into the literature and you understand in a competitive private banking system, what prevents any one bank from inflating relative to its peers, from having a lower reserve ratio than the other members in the system, well, the immediate answer is, oh, well, they'll get presented with a bunch of their notes and demanding payment and they'll run, you know, their vaults will run dry. But if there's a lender of last resort that exists to bail out banks that are, or I shouldn't say bail out, to give a lifeline to banks that are solvent but illiquid, well, then that solves that problem, right? So a bank that engages in fractional reserve banking with very low reserve ratios, it might be perfectly profitable and solvent, Right, if they're good at identifying, uh, you know, credit risks, and they they only lend to borrowers that typically pay them back, and da, 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 right, it's just if you're borrowing short and lending long, right, like your customers put in a bunch in your check in their checking account balances, and then you take a lot of that money out and lend it to other borrowers, well, then you might be perfectly solvent. You have more assets than liabilities, but you're illiquid. Because the nature of you know the the people who deposited money with you, if they think they can just show up next Thursday and get it all out, in the meantime you've lent out most of what they've given you to other people, and you just can't call that back immediately. Those loans, well, there's that inherent illiquidity, and so if you get caught, you're in trouble. But if there's a lender of last resort, it doesn't spell curtains for you. Okay, so you can see how with FDIC and the Federal Reserve, the fact that banks right now in the U.S have low reserve ratios. By the way, this is all screwed up since the financial crisis that actually <laughs> the banks now have a lot of reserves, but I'm saying historically banks had low reserve ratios in the United States, but that wasn't that didn't show Rothbard was wrong. Okay. So, now the question is, well what about if we go to a period where we didn't have FDIC and we didn't have central banks micromanaging things and getting ready to 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 rescue banks? That's that's what the issue is, okay? And so here now, let us go ahead and play this first clip from Selgin from the Soho Forum. And, and this is the bigger answer to your question. Why are we speculating about what bankers might do, might offer to their customers when we've had now three, four centuries of banks in many places offering different products? They've discovered, they discovered fractional reserves They discovered how to administer them, and for the most part, though we know all the horror stories, uh, and in some places, 
much more obviously, this system uh, worked very well for many, many, many people. Bad banking systems have always existed. I'm afraid there are more of them now than ever, but we can trace that to the pernicious interventions of government adulterating what was otherwise be a, a very satisfactory market product. To pick up on that question, George, have you said, I think you've gone on record as saying that Scotland actually practiced something like 5% backing? That low? In, 18, in the 1820s already, Scottish banks generally kept specie reserves of more like 1%, 1 to 2%, with secondary reserves in the form of uh, exchequer bills that could be easily cashed in London. And this was a result of, of experience. And they had uh, almost a century of uh, very, very stable and productive banking. And a Scotsman who got hold of a gold guinea couldn't wait to trade it for a good Scottish banknote. They wanted nothing to do with those clunky old coins. Do you, do you, do you okay. And then I'm gonna let me show you another one. Okay. And this, this one was fairly recently. And, and when I saw Selgin in this interview, that's what set off this latest round of the of the conflict, where I responded to him, and then he came back at me and da da da. Okay, so let's go ahead and play this second clip where Selgin is just a guest on somebody's podcast, talking about the theory and history of free banking. So the system's tied down, and that's why we can explain or understand that there were wasn't a lot of overextension of credit. Doesn't mean that there was uh, any shortage of credit. And this is also important because if the public needed to hold more money, if it's actual demand for balances of Scottish banknotes or deposits grew, then uh, those notes and deposits wouldn't tend to be returned to their sources for redemption. So banks could expand uh, their balance sheets more if they had more people out there who were willing to hold on to their IOUs. So when expansion was consistent with growth in the public's demand for real money balances, then it, it, it was profitable for the banks to uh, take part in it. It was only when the people didn't want to hold more money balances so the notes would come back to the banks, excuse me, that, <clears throat> that they would find that they'd, all, they'd expanded to the safe limits of expansion and couldn't press much further. All right. Um, now, an interesting question to ask at this point is, what does this do to the reserve ratios of the banks? You might think that all this strict discipline of adverse clearings and, and uh, reserve losses and summary diligence would have meant that these Scottish banks would have held very high reserve ratios to keep out of trouble, to keep from failing. But that isn't what happened. In fact, the system was remarkably stable, and this was true of the Canadian system as well. Uh, at the height of the free banking era, let's say around 1830, your average Scottish bank only held about 1% to 2% specie, that is gold or silver reserves. That's it. That's because the, the public's demand for, the public's preference for the Scottish bank's notes and deposits compared to gold was very high after they had established their reliability and safety. So Scottish people didn't want to hold gold uh, guineas or sovereigns later on. They preferred to have a Scottish banknote. Okay, so you can see, I hope, I'm not attacking a straw man here. If you were relying on George Selgin for your knowledge about the theory and history of free banking, it would be crystal clear that, oh yes, the mechanism works very well the banks in the Scottish system had all sorts of mechanisms in place that would check the expansion of any one bank, just like the theory predicts. But the system as a whole actually empirically had very low reserve ratios. And I guess that's just what the market said. And, you know, we're not central planners. We're not armchair socialists here. And so sorry, Murray Rothbard and people who like liked him and his 100% reserve notions, you, you have... This, this blanket uh, contradiction staring you in the face, right? 100% reserve banking does not pass the market test. When we look at the episode of free banking, the, the best one from the literature, namely the Scottish period, look at it, it's not even close. Very low reserve ratios. Okay, so how would one respond to that? First, let me 
read to you an excerpt from Murray Rothbard's harsh uh, review of Larry White's work on free banking in Britain, right? So White has a whole book that came out that was talking about all this, and it it had a big chapter on, you know, the Scottish so-called free banking experience. Okay, so I'm going to be reading from from this. This is um, Rothbard's essay is titled The Myth of Free Banking in Scotland. What I'm reading from is it's, uh, it was originally from the Review of Austrian Economics in 1988. And I am here just relying on, there's a, in his Rothbard's collection, Economic Controversies that the Mises Institute put out that you can get the free PDF at Mises.org. That's where I'm drawing, it was reprinted. Okay. So here's Rothbard. From the, I'm diving into this, you know, several pages into his review. From the beginning, there is one embarrassing and evident fact that Professor White has to cope with, that free, in quotation marks, Scottish banks suspended specie payment when England did in 1797 and, like England, maintained that suspension until 1821. Okay, so this wasn't, this wasn't like under FDR where there was a bank holiday for a little while, you know, and after a couple or with several weeks or whatever, eventually some of the banks started coming back online and then some were permanently closed. No, this is a suspension of specie payment, by which means, remember, back then, hard, you know, money was hard, gold and silver, precious metals, and the banks issued notes, paper notes, that allowed you upon presentation, ostensibly, to get the actual money. Okay. And so when it's, when we talk about banks suspending specie payment, that means people would show up to the bank, give them the note and said, Hey, this note says I'm entitled to a certain amount of gold or silver. And the bank would say, yeah, we're not doing that. That's what it means to suspend specie payment. Okay. So what way has to cope with it? Free Scottish banks suspended specie payment when England did in 1797. And like England maintained that suspension until 1821. So 24 years. This is a fairly long suspension. Rothbard continues, free banks are not supposed to be able to or want to suspend specie payment, thereby violating the property rights of their depositors and note holders, while they themselves are permitted to continue in business and force payment upon their debtors. Okay, so I brought this up and and said, so clearly, you know, if you remember in one of those quotes there, um, you know, Selgin had said in the 1820s when he was trying to explain, you know, when he's pulling a reference as to when, when in, in Scottish banking history uh, d- do I mean that the reserve ratios were very low? And so here it's well, until 1821, there was literally, you know, as, as, as absolute policy, the Scottish banks said, yeah, we're not redeeming. And so it's odd that, you know, that would be pointed to as the period of, oh, yeah, look at how low the reserve ratios were. But when I brought that up, Before, Selgin and his fans on Twitter, their response was, okay, Bob, yeah, sure. If if we had just quoted reserve ratios from 1797 to 1821, fair enough. But no, the Scottish banks had low reserve ratios even before 1797 and after 1821. Okay, so now what's relevant here, I'm going to continue reading from Rothbard, is that... um, it wasn't merely, oh, from the, between those two goalposts, that's when you couldn't turn your Scottish banknotes back into specie. But other than that, yeah, it was clearly redeemable upon demand. That's not the case. All right, so this is from Rothbard's same review. Now I come to the nub that, as a general rule, and not just during the official suspension period, the Scottish banks redeemed in specie in name only. That, in substance, depositors and note holders generally could not redeem the bank's liabilities in specie. The reason that the Scottish banks could afford to be outrageously inflationary, in other words, keep their specie reserves as a minimum, is that in practice they did not really have to pay. Thus, Professor Checkland, and so everybody, including White, recognizes that this guy Checkland is like the authority on the history of Scottish banking in this in this era. Thus, Professor Checkland notes that long before the official suspension, Quote, requests for specie from the Scottish banks met with disapproval and almost with charges of disloyalty. 
And then this is a, a block quote from Checkland. The Scottish system was one of continuous partial suspension of specie payments. No one really expected to be able to enter a Scots bank with a large holding of notes and receive the equivalent immediately in gold or silver. They expected rather an argument or even a rebuff. At best, they would get a little specie and perhaps bills on London. If they made serious trouble, the matter would be noted and they would be and they would find the obtaining of credit more difficult in future. Okay, so again, that is not coming from Murray Rothbard or from Hans Hoppe. That is coming from this guy, Checkland, that White also acknowledges is the authority on this area. Okay, so he's saying it wasn't just between 1797 and 1821. There's a general rule. It was difficult to get the Scottish banks to pay. Okay, um, later on, Rothbard quotes, as the distinguished economic historian Frank W. Fetter put it, writing about Scotland, right? So this is the Frank Fetter that's huge in the Austrian circles, same guy. This is what Fetter had to say about Scotland. Even after the resumption of payments in 1821, right? So remember, earlier Checkland said even before the 1797 and talked about how, yeah, as a general rule, you couldn't turn your notes into specie. They, they would really put up a fight and for sure they would note who you were and then you know blackball you as punishment for the you know the uh outrage that you would show up demanding payment and now here's fetter talking about after 1821 right so we're covering both ends here so this is fetter even after the resumption of payment in 18 payments in 1821 little coin had circulated and to a large degree there was a tradition almost with the force of law that banks should not be required to redeem their notes and coin Redemption in London drafts was the usual form of paying note holders. There was a core of truth in the remark of an anonymous pamphleteer, and Rothbard adds, this is from 1826, quote, any Southern fool, meaning someone coming from south of the, you know, the border between England and Scotland, who had the temerity to ask for a hundred sovereigns might, if his nerves supported him through the cross-examination at the bank counter, think himself in luck to be hunted only to the border. Okay, so so again, Fetter here is confirming that after 1821, it was not standard practice that you could just walk in and redeem your notes. Okay, now, um, I brought this stuff up in one of my responses to Selgin or whatever, and then he came back, and 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 sorry, Larry White did as well. And I and I said, you know, what's what's the response here, guys? That it's not just between 1797 and 1821. Rothbard's got quotes from Checkland and Fetter showing the before and after. Also, it was not standard practice that people expected the Scottish banks to redeem their notes upon demand. And so White said, well, I responded to Rothbard in my book, in the re, you know the revised edition, right? So Rothbard wrote his critique for I guess the first edition, and then when uh, White updated his free banking and in Britain, he had a response that he told me. Well, I went and looked, and he did acknowledge things that um, the Rothbard and then uh, Tyler Cowan and a, a co author whose name I forget, and so and I think even Larry Seacrest, some various critics, you know, responded to White's claims. And then White had a, a chapter just, you know, trying to rebut their claims. But he did not even mention this issue that. Oh, according to some, the banks, since the Scottish banks don't redeem upon demand, this really doesn't count as free banking. All right? he, he, it's not that I'm not saying White gave an answer to that that I don't think was a good answer. White literally doesn't mention it. If you just read White's, and, and he cites Rothbard, but he doesn't mention that part of Rothbard's critique. He just says, oh, according to Rothbard, you know, the, the Scottish banks were just pyramiding credit on top of the, the London notes. And so that, and then he tries to argue against that. Incidentally, as an aside, I don't see how White answers that claim, but that put that aside doesn't matter. For our purposes today, I'm saying he literally doesn't even mention this. So Selgin, though, did respond. So let me now just again, so you understand the back and forth in this. Again, with this stuff, although you can tell what my point of view is, and obviously I think I'm right, and since I think it's better if more people believe the truth, <laughs> I'm hoping I convince you. But really what I want to do is just clarify where the points of disagreement lie at this point. Okay. So here's Selgin now. I'm going to, he wrote this on Twitter, but I don't think I'm, 
betraying anything. We, I'll tell you what, we'll we'll link to this if you want to go look at yourself, but we won't flash it on the screen, right? That's the thing about what stays on Twitter or what happens on Twitter stays on Twitter. But I don't think I'm out of school here by by quoting this. So George says, uh, as Larry himself doesn't address Rothbard's claim that Scottish banks didn't really redeem their notes in specie, even after 1821, I'll respond to it here. First, I think it is probably true that the Scottish banks did much to discourage over-the-counter requests for payment of their notes, though I am far from convinced that if a customer insisted, the banks could refuse with impunity. Okay, so notice, Selgin is not saying, and, and this is a retreat, right? Originally, when I brought up the fact that, oh, from 1797 to 1821, the answer was, okay, Bob, but other than that, you know, if you go outside those periods then, you know, the reserve ratio is still low. So there you go. So they didn't say, yeah, even after those periods, it's, it's maybe true that it was a hassle to redeem. Like, that's what I'm saying. With all this stuff, it's pulling teeth from these fraction reserve free bankers that they keep making one line of defense. Then you go do more research and say, no, that's not true because of this. They go, oh, oh yeah, but the thing is, and then they just say something else. So I'm just, that's my experience with this. So anyway, um, so here he's admitting, yeah, it, it's possible that, in general, just you trying to turn your Scottish banknotes into specie could be met with protest and, and hassles and delays. Okay. Then he says that the banks kept specie at all means that they were occasionally paying it out to someone. Okay. So that's an interesting argument that he's, <laughs> it's gone from, hey, the very low reserve ratios in the Scottish banks show that free banking is consistent with low reserve ratios too. Well, I'm sure they must have been honoring somebody when they turn the notes in, because otherwise, why are they holding any gold or silver at all? Right, that's kind of a weird, but okay. But this refers only to requests by ordinary bank customers. What is certain is that when it came to settlement with other banks, the Scottish banks had to honor their promises at once. That is, quote, summary diligence was in play. All right, and so he's arguing that, yeah, maybe the, the little guy, just a random Joe who shows up to the bank with some notes can't get it, but when the other banks present notes uh you know in their in their clearinghouse operations then they have to settle up okay and he says it's true that they could and did settle with london bills in lieu of specie but that was by common agreement among the banks an agreement that allowed them to maximize their interest earnings and they had to settle on demand or else how do i know simply because despite the system's relatively good record Scottish banks failed regularly where failure meant failing to honor their promises. So active redemption was a thing. Okay. So here I think he's, so, so notice it, it's, he's more deducing that they must have been honoring their payments, right? It's not that he's saying, yes, we have the records we can see, you know, look at April 17th, uh, 1824. We can see that how many, you know, how much gold was shipped from this bank from to this other bank in Scotland because they presented it right. He's, he's not giving evidence like that. He's more deducing. Well, they must have been honoring because I know occasionally some banks failed and why would a bank fail except that it couldn't live up to its contractual obligation. But notice, no, that's, that's not quite right. There's pizza shops that go out of business. It's not because they engaged in reckless note issue, right? A business can fail not simply because it issued notes that it can't redeem. Okay. So that I means so that's one element here, but beyond that, I'm going to um, show you in a moment, I'm going to go through the history and show just how often it was that other banks did not have their, you know, wouldn't be, have their thing honored. And it was a laborious process involving court. Okay, just to underscore, this was not some matter of fact thing. Kind of like, yeah, when you uh, when you order an Uber, they show up, right? And and if it was a case that no, you ordered Uber, and most of the time they wouldn't show up, and you had to go to court and get, you know, what I mean, like that would be. Or if life insurance, if it was that, it was very common that the life insurance companies didn't pay, and you had to take them to court, and maybe years later you'd finally get. But that wouldn't be a well functioning market that free marketeers would hold up. Okay, so that that's what I'm getting at here is that Selgin notice when he's trying to show that Rothbart's quotes don't matter, he's relying on the fact, well, occasionally some banks went down, so clearly they must have been having their obligations enforced on them, right? And I'm just saying that no, there's a lot 
there, and that's certainly not rebutting the quotes from Checklin and Fetter that I just presented. Okay, and then Selgin has one last point. It's important to note here that throughout my writings, I have stressed the fact that it is interbank settlement and redemption that is the key source of discipline in free banking systems. In fact, starting with my theory of free banking, that that's a book, um, I assume that ordinary persons don't ask to redeem bank money. So whatever one thinks of the Scottish bank's practice, it wasn't inconsistent with what my theory assumes. Okay. So what he's arguing now here is, hey, even if it's true that the regular people, both before 1797 and after 1821, couldn't go up to a Scottish bank, turn in their notes and get the money, the fact that the big boys could, right? So it's kind of like how after 1933, Regular people couldn't turn in U.S. dollars and get gold, but other central banks could, right? And even during the you know the Bretton Woods era, it's like the big boys could could turn in their dollars for gold. So that's what Selgin is saying here that this is um, sort of like a gold exchange standard or something, where the other major institutions, if they had a bunch of your notes, they could present them and say you owe us this much specie, even though individual merchants and stuff maybe they couldn't. And he's saying. That's consistent with my theory because it's pretty standard in this literature that you say, even if the regular people accept notes at par and just give it to their own bank, then it's the interbank clearing process where, you know, the chickens come home to roost if there's one bank in the system that's too inflationary, right? That's what he's arguing here. So that's now Selgin's claim. Let me now, uh, uh, sorry, and there's, there's one other thing too. Selgin, I, I didn't quote it here, but Selgin and his fans also on this stuff have said repeatedly, okay, guys, you keep pointing to Scotland. There's plenty of other examples from all over the world of free banking, and the reserve ratios are always low in those places too. Okay, so even if you guys want to quibble with Scotland and point to all kinds of extenuate, so what? We'll throw Scotland out, look at all the other examples. And so my response to that is, I wasn't the one who's highlighted Scotland. It's consistently Selgin who holds up Scotland and Canada is the primary examples of free banking in action. And then also here, let me now read to you. We've got, um, this is from Larry Seacrest's book. And he quotes um, Larry White, who says, because we lack knowledge of any other truly free banking systems of significance, the Scottish experience interpreted in the light of our theoretical construction uh, must largely inform our understanding of what we should generally expect from free banking. Okay, so that's a quote from Larry White explaining why the Scottish case is so important. According to White, as of that quotation, at least he was saying, "Yeah, really, it's Scotland is so far above the other examples in terms of its fidelity to the free banking assumptions that really we just need to look at Scotland." Okay, so if the Scottish case falls apart, it's not really proper, I think, for the free bankers to say, oh, come on, we got all these other examples too, that apparently, you know, people hold up the Scottish example for a reason. Okay. By the way, when I had said that White doesn't even mention that Rothbard brought up this issue of convert, you know, redeemability, what's called convertibility, in his book, chapter responding, let me here also just give you another example of why I'm saying these these guys are a bit slippery. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. So this was from um, a Cato blog or a Cato Institute blog post that was like reposted from Alt-M and it's called, so this is from April of 2015, What You Should Know About Free Banking History by Larry White. Okay. And the first example, the first case study is Scotland. And he says, the Scottish free banking system of 1716 to 1845. Okay, so those are the periods when he's telling us now of you know what, what how this should should count. This this is the stretch. Combined remarkable stability with competitive performance. To quote my own earlier work on it, there were quote many competing banks. Most of them were well capitalized. While in its heyday after 1810, quote none were exceptionally large. All but a few are extensively branched and all offered a narrow spread between deposit and discount rates of interest. Um, but da, 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 they note that some writers have given at least partial credit to unlimited liability. Okay, I'm just I'm skipping stuff. Uh, 
After 1810, the three chartered banks, the only banks with limited liability, were no larger than the non-chartered banks and did not play any special supervisory roles, so there was really no such thing as like a central bank. While the system continued to perform successfully, Scottish banking exhibited economies of scale, but not a natural monopoly. The banks mutually accepted one another's notes at par. A few writers have expressed doubt that Scotland was a good example of free banking on the grounds that the Bank of England backstopped the system, but such claims are mistaken. All right, and then there he refers to his chapter rebutting the critics. So again, I'm saying here, when Larry White is summarizing, summarizing for the you know the reader, hey, thirty thousand foot view, what do you need to know about free banking? That was literally the title of the post, and he goes through the case studies to talk about Scotland, and then even acknowledges some critics have said it does it's not a good example of free bank. Again, literally doesn't even mention the fact that. Oh, yeah. Now, some people have brought up that for decades, they didn't redeem their notes, but it doesn't even bring that up. Okay. So now let me um, mention, or let me go through here from Larry White's book, Free Banking in Great Britain. I'm responding to Selgin's attempt to say, hey, whether or not the uh, the banks redeemed the individual depositors' notes. Who cares? That's not really the, the theory of free banking. We can take it or leave it. Okay, so let me just ex- show that the only reason Selgin is saying that is because he's been backed into a corner. Okay? this is That's not how they lead with the free banking stuff. Rothbard is entirely correct when he was saying, I'm paraphrasing that, free bankers are not supposed to want to suspend specie payment like that's not in the model that's not how it's supposed to work like the right i mean that's the defenders of free banking are saying to the interventionists don't worry you don't need special regulation to ensure that there's adequate reserves and things like that because the market discipline will make sure that the banks can't get too reckless right and so then if it turns out that the banks just for decades aren't paying people upon demand that's kind of weird right it'd be like if somebody said, yeah, every, you know, I, people go to McDonald's and they give them money and then they just don't give them their food. And then eventually they just leave and they, they give them like a note saying, here, this entitles you to one burger. And then if Selgin said, oh, yeah, I mean, maybe for a little bit, but I mean, like if another big business comes along, I mean, they have to give them the burgers, right? right? That would be weird. Like that, that wouldn't be proving to anybody the efficacy of that system. Okay. But in any event, I'm going to say that's not how the theory of free banking is presented. It's only that Selgin has been backed into that corner by the evidence showing that in practice, that's not what the Scottish banks were doing. Okay. So here's Larry White in his uh, early chapter laying out the theory of free banking. So he goes through and explains like the profit maximizing conditions that will be true in terms of them setting the reserve ratios and things like that. And now here he's going to talk about the issues that an individual bank embedded in a market, in a, in a, in a free banking system, uh, the, the conditions that this bank faces, and then he's going to talk about what the system produces because of that. So let's, let's take a listen here. It is very important to understand the cost associated with maintaining notes in circulation, if only because the 19th century opponents of free banking so often built their case on the implicit assumption that a bank of issue could extend its circulation gratuitously. All right, so what again, what White's trying to do here is he's trying to say there's this caricature of free banking and just, oh yeah, there's swindlers and wildcats and they can just issue notes and there's nothing stopping them, right? And that's why we need heavy-handed government regulation to come in and spank those bankers and make sure that they're honest and they only issue notes if they can back it up with the vault and did it right. And White is saying that, no, let's look at practice or so let's look at, at the constraints that in practice an individual bank in such a system faces to see that those fears are are misplaced. It is one thing to print up notes and to initiate their circulation. It is quite another to maintain their circulation in a competitive environment where the plurality of competing issuers gives the public a choice among brands of banknotes. Each issuer must expend resources in giving his brand the qualities most attractive to at least some members of the public for some purposes. We should expect the rivalry among note issuers to be in many ways similar to the present day rivalry among issuers of checking accounts. Okay, so again, we've got all these different competing banks that are all issuing their own brand name notes that are saying, 
if you turn this note back into us, we will give you either gold or silver, right? And so different banks have different notes saying those words, but the notes look different, right? You can tell, oh, this is a note issued by that bank and they're hard to counterfeit and things like that. Perhaps the most elementary quality dimension on which the public may be expected to distinguish among banknote brands as among checking account brands is ease of redemption. To attract a greater clientele requires, therefore, such expenses as longer operating hours, a greater number of tellers, additional local branch offices, and more extensive advertising of the availability of these conveniences. A second area of quality competition is public confidence in the reliability of an issuer's notes. Individuals will be less disposed to hold the notes of a less trustworthy issuer so that issuers must compete to convince the public of their superior reliability. Under a system of private bank notes, convertible at par into specie, the primary aspect of reliability is the assurance that convertibility will not be delayed or denied on account of the bankruptcy, illiquidity, or fraud of the issuing bank. Confidence-bolstering investments would include construction and maintenance of an impressive bank edifice, publicity of the bank's sound financial health, image advertising, and whatever else effectively reassures note holders that theirs are not the notes of a fly-by-night outfit. A secondary aspect of reliability is the ease with which the authenticity of individual notes may be ascertained. Enhancing public confidence in their genuine character might call for greater expenditures on the designing, engraving, watermarking, and signing of notes, or for more generous, costly policy toward counterfeit notes tendered by innocent parties. Okay? So here, again, this it's not that I dove in, uh, you know, six pages into it. Like, this is when, when White, you know, is explaining what the individual bank is facing here. You know, he'd already gone through, and like, it's profit maximizing, you know, conditions and things like that in terms of equations. But now in words, when he's just talking about, let's expand a little bit, what would restrain an individual bank from just issuing notes willy-nilly the way the opponents of free banking thought. Notice what he talked about there. Right out of the gate, he just kept stressing how, yes, the public must absolutely be convinced you can turn this particular bank's notes into specie. And then, oh, and you know that's why you got to have a big bank, you know, big pillars and so forth. They have to have impressive buildings because you got to instill confidence in the public. It's that that's the whole point of, you know, why would you hold your notes from this one bank and not from its competitor? Because I know, oh, these notes are trustworthy. I can just turn these into specie and there's not going to be a delay. Not just that I'm getting my specie at some point, I'm going to get it right away. Okay? So that's clearly, if it's now the story is going to be, oh yeah, maybe it's true that not just between 1797 and 1821, but even for decades before and decades after, regular people couldn't, as a rule, turn their notes into Scottish banks and get specie. That is no longer conforming to what Larry White in his own book said is the model that we're now going to in the next chapter apply to the case of Scotland. Okay, so I understand. I'm not saying Selgin was lying. I understand what he's talking about. It's, it's true that like Mies is also like in, in human action assumes for a system of free banking, let's just say everybody, every merchant, whatever, takes all the notes at par and then just shows still the clearinghouse system polices it. But That's different from saying the theory of free banking doesn't rely on the public being able to convert their notes. Yes, the standard theory does. And that's the whole point. Let me put it to you this way. If it turned out that Selgin was going to say, oh, yeah, sure, laissez-faire in banking means that the banks might systematically for decades at a time not honor their ostensible obligations for the little guy. But if a big company comes up. That's not going to win a lot of converts over. That makes it sound like it's, you know, the mafia running their show or something, right? To say big businesses can lean on each other and have other big businesses and honor their contracts, but the little guy is out of luck. That's not a ringing endorsement of laissez-faire, okay? So I'm just saying, even on his own terms, Selgin's given away 90% of the game already. Okay, let me... Now, uh, just read from an account of Scotland just to show that even on Selgin's own terms, I don't think it's true, right? So it's Selgin would have us believe, yeah, individual uh, merchants or whatever might turn in some notes and be turned away, 
or you know, be given the stare down. But you know, big reputable banks, when they turned over a bunch of notes, surely they would get paid from you know their 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 rival banks. So let let's see if that's true. So I'm going to be reading from this history of Scottish banking. The Bank of Scotland was created by an act of the Scottish Parliament in 1695, one year after the creation of the Bank of England. The act provided a legal monopoly on banking and the right of note issue for 21 years. Da 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 da. Okay. Um, so then there was a competitor called the Royal Bank of Scotland that came along in 1727 to now be the first competitor to that original bank. And it says the British Parliament turned a deaf ear to the original bank's petitions against the chartering of its first rival, the pointedly named Royal Bank of Scotland in 1727. An acrimonious rivalry between the two banks arose the day the new bank opened its doors. Both banks were housed in Edinburgh. As the Royal Bank's historian Monroe puts it, at close quarters opened a brisk duel in which the combatants used each other's notes as missiles. Right? So the note, remember, said, you turn this thing in, you get gold or silver. And so now that this rival opened up, they were accumulating each other's notes and then they would, you know, turn them over and say, hey, give me, give me the specie. And that that's their using to um, attack each other. The Royal Bank dispatched agents to trade its new notes for Bank of Scotland notes and to present the latter in large quantities at the old bank's office for redemption in coin, hoping to embarrass its rival, right? So they were strategic, like they would stockpile them and then just show up and say, boom, here's a bunch of notes that says payable upon demand. You guys got it in the vault? So let's see what happened. The old bank responded in kind, but lost the duel. Oh, okay. So what, so what happened? By March 1728, it was forced to suspend payments, call in its loans, make a 10% call upon its shareholders, and even close its doors for several weeks. Okay, so remember, in the other thing I read to you, when White was given the big picture summary of what is the free banking period in Scotland, he said from 1716 to 1845. So here we've just seen now, reading from this particular historical account that um, in, as, in 1728, the original bank suspended payments, right? So notice that's within the period. So we already, do you get what I'm saying? So <laughs> what we're disputing is between 1716 and 1845, which is the ostensible period of free banking, we're trying to figure out when in that period is it true that the big banks honored specie payment at least from presented you know by their rival banks so we already know from 1797 to 1821 it's out and now i'm showing there was a big episode here in 1728 this wasn't from little guys this was from its first rival presenting notes and it had to suspend payment okay and then also to show that that wasn't the first time this history goes on to say this was already the third suspension in the bank of scotland's history a run on the bank in 1704 blah 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 the same policies were adopted for the eight-month suspension following a run during the civil unrest of 1715, and again for the eight-month suspensions of 1728. Okay, so for this one, it's, it was an eight-month suspension. Okay, so again, this is, these are longer suspensions than the bank holidays under FDR. Okay, so again, that 1728, there was an eight-month suspension, and the, the whole point was it was because its rival was strategically holding notes. Okay, so at the very... You know, we, we can say free banking at best from 1728 or 29 onward up till 1797. You see how the, the zone is shrinking here. Okay. Um, and so what ended up happening is the Bank of Scotland's directors in 1730 began inserting an option clause into the obligation printed on its notes. Okay. Let, let me read. I'll just do one more of these folks. So I'm reading from the same history. Um. In the 1750s, there were some banks in uh, Glasgow that emerged as rivals to the Edinburgh more established banks. Okay, so let's see what happened there. By 1756, the Glasgow banks were ready to come to terms with the Edinburgh banks and, in fact, proposed a geographical division of the Scottish market between the pairs of banks. No agreement on terms could be reached. Once again, the inherent instability of cartels had preserved competition in Scottish banking, right? So they were realizing, oh, wait, we keep competing with each other and presenting each other's notes. Hey, can we just come up with an agreement to kind of divvy up the neighborhoods kind of deal? And they couldn't work out. They couldn't come to terms. 
And so this writer is saying it's, it's preserving competition, Scottish banking. So what happened? The chartered banks then allegedly turned jointly to the tactic of note dueling, meaning the chartered, meaning the Edinburgh banks, but their Glasgow rivals survived the assault by a series of evasive maneuvers. Okay, now, now that's interesting. What does that mean, right? So he's saying, this writer is saying that the Edinburgh banks to try to deal with these Glasgow upstarts started presenting the notes to try to, you know, catch them with their pants down. And it says their Glasgow rivals survived the assault by a series of evasive maneuvers. Now, what does that mean, right? Like that's, this isn't like a, a, a duel between fighter jets and evasive maneuvers means you get out of the way, you know, so here, what does it mean? Oh, now we can see what it means. An agent of the public banks eventually brought suit against the arms bank. So arms is one of the Glasgow banks for non-payment of notes. After three years of proceedings, an out-of-court settlement was reached. One historian has correctly commented that the Glasgow banks would never have had to resort to ruses had they kept sufficient specie reserves against their notes. The, the sufficient quantity of reserves, however, was something that bankers could learn only through trial and error. Ah, yeah. Okay, so do you see what's happening here? So I earlier showed you how once that first big competitor came in, there was an eight-month suspension, you know, in, well into the period of when White had said it started. And now I'm showing you in 1756, there's a well documented period where these Glasgow banks were engaged in a series of evasive maneuvers. And finally, one of the banks brought suit and it took three years in court before they finally got a settlement. Okay. So it, the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's not obvious that throughout all this, we should be saying, oh, yes, this is probably just standard practice that the rival banks could present notes that, if, you, if you get what I'm saying. All right. So, and I could continue to go through this history and give you case after case like this to show of, of you know, there was banks that refused to redeem. And then it took a long, drawn out process before finally they were brought to heel through the legal system. Okay. And then there was, um, they, they had to outlaw the uh, option that was in the 1760s, where they finally settled the matter about, yeah, you can't just print on your notes that, you know, we have the right to, to, not, to not redeem if we want, you know, there's things like that as well. Okay, so I am just showing that, notice how far we've been pushed back, right? At this point, Selgin threw in the towel on individuals being able to redeem and said, yeah, for all I know, it's, it's possible that Fetter and Checkland aren't wrong on that. And the average people, even before the official uh, period of non-redemption, also couldn't redeem. And now I'm just showing you the actual history here is littered with examples of other banks presenting notes and then causing the original one to suspend redemption for months at a time. And notice, they don't, in, in this case, you know, I, I don't know if they went out of business, but in that first case, that, the issuing bank, it didn't go under. It didn't have to close its doors. It just said, yeah, we're not redeeming for eight months. Okay. And I'm saying there's all kinds of examples of that. I, for the interest of time here, I won't go through more of where this historian is talking about, oh, yeah, so then there was this episode, and then these banks did this, and this bank didn't have sufficient reserves, so they just suspended payment, and then the other people brought suit, and then this happened, and then the bank you know, eventually resumed. And it's not that the bank went out of business because it didn't honor its contracts. It was just, oh, yeah, it suspended payment, and then this is what happened. And, and so I'm, I'm just saying this idea that the banks knew full well if we don't redeem our notes when our rivals present them, then it's curtains for us. No, no that's not true. Incidentally, the, the historian here I'm reading from is Larry White. This is the same book. This is the next chapter in his book, right? So it's not <laughs> that you have to go looking far and wide to, to see that the history of Scottish banking is rife with the banks refusing to honor their ostensible uh, obligations. Okay. Interestingly, as I wrap up here, um, this is what Milton Friedman had to say about free banking. And this is from his A Program for Monetary Stability, 1960. This is Milton Friedman. A fiduciary currency, meaning like banks issuing notes 
that are not themselves the, the actual legal tender money, but just claims on the underlying money. A fiduciary currency ostensibly convertible into the monetary commodity is therefore likely to become overissued from time to time, and convertibility is likely to become impossible. Historically, this is what happened under so-called free banking in the United States and under similar circumstances in other countries. Okay, so that was Friedman, and I, I, I think you know his his uh, conclusion there is you un- you understand why he ended up there. That's that's kind of where I am as well. So, uh, last thing I'm going to say because otherwise Larry White's going to think I'm being dishonest. Friedman later was more sympathetic to free banking, but I went and read. You know him talking about what made me soften my views and whatever, and he, he cites White, and th- but nowhere did I see Friedman saying, "I used to think that under free banking and the, like the Scottish and U.S. experiences showed that the banks might just suspend convertibility, and that's kind of an issue." But now I realize I was wrong. Like he doesn't say that, right? So it's true. Friedman, after that 1960s judgment, did was more sympathetic to free banking, but I did not see him explain. That oh yeah, that specific reason he just gave there, that issue of yeah, it looks like if I when I look at history, it seems like the banks often would over issue notes and then suspend redemption concept because of that. I don't see him anywhere explaining, oh yeah, I was wrong about that. It didn't happen. That's not what, it's because it clearly did happen all the time. Okay, so in conclusion, my t- two big points. Number one is I do not think you can look at the Scottish example and what the reserve ratios were of the Scottish banks during this period and say that gives us a good clue as to what the reserve ratio would be in a genuinely free market. Because as we've seen, there was a a long period, 23 or 24, depending on the count, period where they didn't redeem even as a matter of official policy. We've got two authorities showing that even before and after those official periods of suspension, that regular people couldn't turn it in. And Selgin says, yeah, I got no problem with that. That could be true. And then now we're just arguing about when could other banks demand payment? And there's plenty of examples throughout this history of banks, you know, suspending payment and then not going under, by the way, they're still allowed to stay in business too. Okay. So it seems, I think it's pretty consistent here that the idea that these banks, these notes are redeemable upon demand, and that totally deviates from the standard model as White himself laid out in that very same book before he then proceeded to apply the model to Scotland. As we've seen, he's saying that, yeah, this, uh, the way a free bank attracts customers and gets people to hold its notes is they have to be absolutely convinced they can redeem their notes for specie. And we've seen that's not at all the case in Scotland. Okay. So whatever other lessons we might draw from the Scottish experience to say, what would the reserve ratio be in a system where if you overissue its curtains, it's not the Scottish experience. That doesn't tell us anything about that. Second point, if I were an interventionist, I would conclude the way Milton Friedman did. And I would say, yeah, it looks like free banking in uh, at least a historical experience leads to overissue and you can't trust the market economy when regulated by government, a government legal system to enforce these contracts. It just looks for whatever reason, banks are allowed to just renege on their contractual obligations. And at best, it takes years to finally get them to settle. And so you could see why a conventional economist would then conclude, it looks like free banking doesn't work, at least if we want banks to honor their contracts to their regular customers. But what I would just say is, no, I still believe in free banking. I still think what Mises wrote in Human Action is correct. Um, it's just, I would say what, what this showed is you can't rely on the government to enforce contracts, right? That that's to me the, the lesson. So yeah, the problem here is not that the Scottish banks weren't regulated enough. The problem is the legal system still in Scotland was not laissez faire that itself, you know, contract enforcement was administered by the state. Okay, and so I that's why I would still predict that yes, in a fully blown free market society, including where contract enforcement is done with market forces, not the political authorities, that's where, you know, the banks will truly would have no special privileges and they couldn't just say, 
yeah, I know these notes say that we're supposed to pay you, but we're not going to do that for eight months. And maybe after eight months, we'll start honoring our contract. Like you're not allowed to do that. And I'm saying, I think in a system like that, you would see much higher reserve ratios than what we saw historically in the Scottish experience. Okay, well, I need to wrap it up there. Thanks for your attention, everybody. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.